part 12. Oh, it's part 12, don't worry. Um, this is, uh, we've been going through the book, uh, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief by Douglas L. Um, and uh, it's available online, so you can read it ahead of time if you want to. Um, you can also get it uh, uh, in hard copy if you want. And uh, uh, that's the cover. Um, we are into part two, The Science of Belief, and chapter 14, uh, Foundation of Thought. And he asked the question, what is the universe made of? And as the site in the beginning was the word. Many of you recognize that as the beginning of John 1.1. 1, 1. He starts out, this book uses the term number in a very broad sense. It is meant to include all of mathematics, not just numbers in the narrow sense, like 1, 3, 17, the square root of 3, and so on, but all mathematical equations and concepts all of the patterns and beauty of mathematics. One feature of modern physics that is almost taken for granted, but is truly astonishing when you step back and think about it, is that the number, fantastically complicated mathematics, has taken standard stage. Centuries ago, you could perhaps say that number was useful only occasionally and in unexpected ways. Take Kepler's first law that the orbits of the planets and ellipses with the sun at one of, two, uh, one of the two foci. Cute, but obviously of limited use, and not very helpful in understanding why things are the way they are, well, until you put them into Newton's calculus. Then in 1687, Newton gave us his three classical laws of motion and his theory of universal gravitation. Newton discovered the system of the world, how things appear in our everyday human scale of reality, and he was able to describe it using nothing more than high school algebra. Well, depends on where you went to high school, I guess. Um, but certainly elementary calculus, which is what he had to invent in order to do this. After Newton, we knew that number plays a central role in understanding how the universe works. In Newton's physics, there's a special state of rest. Einstein taught us this is an illusion and only relative motion can be measured. This is part of his theory of special relativity. Einstein also taught us that we can't measure or detect any difference between the force of gravity and merely accelerated motion. This is the equivalence principle, which underlies his theory of general relativity. The laws of physics are exactly the same in each. These are the symmetries of our universe, and the equations of general relativity have been described as a thing of dazzling beauty. Einstein connected, using concepts of number, our three spatial dimensions with the fourth dimension of time to build us a new concept of a four-dimensional space-time. Einstein connected mass and energy with his most famous equation, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, we now know that matter transforms into energy and energy to matter by mathematical formula. And both bend time and space according to beautifully symmetric concepts of number. Einstein illuminated deep mathematical connections among energy, matter, space, and time. For example, energy exerts a gravitational force. There's a great deal more that could be said about the mathematical nature of the universe. English physicist Roger Penrose, who noted the extreme fine-tuning of the Big Bang described in Chapter 8, says quite a lot in his book, The Road to Reality, A Complete Guide to the Laws of the Universe. Near the end, on page 1033, he writes, the most important single insight that has emerged from our journey of more than two and a half millennia is that there is a deep unity between certain areas of mathematics and the workings of the physical world. This journey from human scale reality to an appreciation of the mathematical underpinnings of the universe appears to be accelerating. Recent discoveries suggest we have more to learn. Scientists have discovered that all of what we directly experience is only about 5% of the total mass and energy in the universe. About 27% is so-called dark matter, which has a gravitational field and mass, but otherwise seems to be undetectable 
at least so far. Which means that that's over five times as much that we don't see as we do see. Dark matter provides gravitational scaffolding for galaxies. We now know that it is essential for the formation of galaxies in this life as we know it. The remaining 68% is so-called dark energy, a mysterious force causing all galaxies to accelerate away from each other. We don't know much about dark matter and dark energy, but they may be hidden features of the mathematical structure of space-time. At least, that's my theory. I'm not reading everything that he says, uh, if you want to go to the book in the original. If there is only number beneath, what then of belief in God? Concepts of number are only ideas. They have no meaning as anything but ideas. Whose ideas could they be? I believe they're ideas in the mind of God. To me, the foundation, the underpinnings of all existence may ultimately be ideas in the mind of a God, a thought of our creator. This is my belief. I don't claim that modern science compels such a conclusion, but to me it is a wondrous harmonization of modern science with the Abrahamic concept of a creator God. And I would add that modern science pushes us towards that conclusion, as has been recognized by a number of other people. A number, and perhaps only number, is the foundation beneath our reality. Number is the art of ideas. Whose ideas? To me, the mathematical nature of the universe is part of the seventh wonder of modern science, part of the evidence towards a universe created by thought. This may sound strange, so let me clarify. I am not suggesting that everything in the universe reduces to a mathematical equation or numerical concept. Love, hope, joy, wonder, and so much more are clearly not just numerical. I am also am not suggesting that because the foundation of the universe is mathematical, the thoughts of God control everything. I do believe we are given free will. As we will see, some think quantum physics and free will are connected. I believe God has used thought to create the foundation of the universe, interstellar space, and all matter and energy and forces, but also has created on that foundation creatures such as human beings with free will. At this stage, I doubt you're convinced. Sure, you say, number and math are everywhere in physics and the sciences, but how else can we measure, compute, and predict? Maybe we haven't found the smallest particle yet, but there are particles, there are electrons and protons and neutrons. How can the foundation be only number, only thought? I understand these doubts, but let's look closely at those microscopic and subatomic particles. Enter their reality, the reality of the quantum, quantum physics. In quantum physics, you get underneath normal concepts of matter, space, and time. Quantum physics deals with the properties and behaviors of the universe at a very small scales. It is one of the most powerful and successful theories in all of science. A key feature is the uncertainty principle. You can never exactly measure both the position of a particle and its velocity, or energy and time. There are several other pairs like that. There's always some uncertainty as to position, velocity, or both. This is not just a limitation of our ability to measure. It's a deeper truth. The truth is that subatomic particles don't have exact positions or velocities. Their true nature can only be described by complicated mathematical equations that give probabilities of where a particle may ultimately be detected and what its velocity may be. This is the essence of Schrodinger's wave equation, first proposed by Erwin Rudolf Josef Alexander Schrodinger, uh, quite a moniker there, in 1935 after extensive correspondence with Albert Einstein. The uncertainty principle holds that the universe is not deterministic, which leaves room for free will. You cannot predict what will happen from what has happened before. Antoine Suarez, a Swiss quantum physicist, philosopher, and bioethicist, and director of the Center for Quantum Philosophy, goes further. He suggests that quantum physics follows from free will. 
In quantum physics, ordinary reality at our human scale disappears and yields to number, heavy math. Schrodinger wave equations, Hamiltonian operators, Klein-Gordon equations, Hilbert spaces, eigenfunctions, Lie algebras, and more. Time and space do not permit discussion of these concepts. Go ask your mother. In his miracle year of 1905, Einstein proposed that light comes in packets called quanta. This was another shock to the scientific community, another triumph of Einstein's ability to think outside the prevailing worldview, although as uh, we found out he uh, had trouble thinking too far outside of it. Uh, the paradigm for hundreds of years had been that light is a wave, and wave theory of light was used to create optical instruments and explain other phenomena like the rainbow. But we now know that light comes in particles, individual photons. In high school, I read of the debate over the real nature of light. Is it really a particle or a wave? The strange truth is that light is both, and it is neither. If that doesn't seem right, it is because our human reality is not the reality of subatomic particles. In fact, it gets weirder, much weirder. And it isn't just photons that are weird, it's all matter. To see how weird quantum physics really is, let's look at three different types of experiments. One slit, two slit, entanglement, and the quantum Zeno effect. One slit, two slit. Supposing we send a beam of light through a single slit. The result is a simple line of intensity. It's like we're shooting bullets through the slit. So light is a particle, right? Now suppose we send the beam of light through two parallel slits, as in the following diagram. And here's this diagram. You can see the light being shined, hits both slits, and instead of giving you two parallel beams, it gives you a whole bunch of them. If we were shooting bullets, we would get two parallel lines of intensity, but what we actually get is an interference pattern. The waves of the light beam interfere with each other, and where the wave peaks coincide is where the light is the brightest. It's exactly as if waves emanating from the slits were interfering with each other. So light is a wave, right? Now we do the two-slit experiment again, but this time we send the photons through one at a time. What should we expect? If light is a particle, we should get two parallel lines. Again, like shooting individual bullets. If light is a wave, we're only sending one wave through at a time, so again, we should get two parallel lines of intensity, right? Wrong. We still get an interference pattern. Somehow, each individual photon interferes with itself. How can this be? As physicist Richard Feynman put it, the photon goes through one slit and it goes through both slits. Our human scale reality is not the atomic scale reality of the photon. This one slit, two slit experiment doesn't just work for photons of light. It also works for electrons and protons and even with molecules. Buckyball molecules, that's 60 carbon atoms put together almost 500,000 times larger than a proton were found to exhibit wave-like interference. They go through both slits at the same time. All ordinary matter acts both like a wave and like a particle and has this ability to interfere with itself. Entanglement. In quantum physics, two particles can be entangled. This means they share the same quantum phase state, which means they are exactly alike. Here's one description. Quantum, ent uh, quantum entanglement, and this is, I think, a quote, occurs when particles such as photons, electrons, molecules as large as buckyballs and even small diamonds interact physically and then become separate. The type of interaction is such that each resulting member of a pair is properly described by the same quantum mechanical description or state, which is indefinite in terms of important factors such as position, momentum, spin, polarization, etc. When particles are so entangled, whatever you measure on one will be true of the other. And if you change one, you change the other. Before you observe or measure them, 
Both particles will be in some unknown quantum state with unknown qualities such as momentum, spin, and polarization. But when you observe or measure one, the other is affected even if the particles are widely separated. In May 2012, scientists demonstrated quantum entanglement between photons over 88 miles apart between two Canary Islands. Scientists believe there is no limit as to far, how far apart the particles can be. The moon, the sun. Theoretically, you could take one and move it to the other side of the universe, and if you did not observe or measure either, they would remain entangled. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. That's plenty weird, but here's the really weird part. Observing or measuring one particle changes the other instantaneously. It happens faster than the speed of light. There is no delay whatsoever. This has been confirmed in experiments with measurements done before light could travel between the two particles. I know this sounds like a mistake, but it's true. This faster than light action has been repeatedly proven. Entangled particles are connected outside of space and time. There is no story in space and time that tells us how the, the correlations happen, states Nicholas Gissen, an experimental physicist at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. There must exist some reality outside of space-time. The universe is not a closed system. It has not only novelty coming in from the outside, it has order coming in from the outside. Then the quantum Zeno effect, one of the paradoxes attributed to the ancient Greek philosopher known as Zeno, involved the motion of an arrow. The paradox is that because at any instant when you look at the arrow, it is at a particular place and not moving, the arrow cannot possibly move. The quantum Zeno effect is similar in that observing or measuring a system alters it. It's the quantum equivalent of a watch pot never boils. It has been experimentally confirmed, for example, that unstable particles will not decay or will decay less rapidly if they are observed. Somehow, observation changes the quantum system. We're talking pure observation, not interacting with the system in any way. The same mystery occurs in the one-slit, two-slit experiment. Supposing we send particles one at a time through two slits as before. We get an interference pattern. The individual particles somehow interfere with themselves. Now supposing we observe them going through the two slits. The interference pattern disappears. We get two parallel lines of intensity. The observer can decide whether or not to put detectors into the interfering path. That way, by deciding whether or not to determine the path through the two-slit experiment, he or she can decide which property can become reality. If he or she chooses not to put the detectors there, then the interference pattern will become reality. If he or she puts, does put the detectors there, then the beam path will become reality. Yet, most importantly, the observer has no influence on the specific element of the world that becomes reality. That is, you can determine it will go through path A or path B, but not whether it goes through path A or path B. That's something the particle decides, or whoever is managing the particle. Specifically, or he, if he or she chooses to determine the path, and he, he or she has no influence whatsoever on which of the two paths, the left or the right one, nature will tell him. Her is the one in which the particle is found. Likewise, if he or she chooses to, the, to observe the interference pattern, then he or she has no influence whatsoever on where in the observation plan, plane he or she will observe a specific particle. It goes where it wants to, but with interference. Somehow the act of observing changes in the quantum, the, the, pardon me, somehow the act of observing changes the quantum system. Physics, physicists speak of quantum waveforms collapsing. What does that mean? 
So we see that deep down at the quantum level, our common sense intuition as to how the universe works disappears. The reality of the quantum is not the reality we experience. What does this mean? What does it suggest about the substructure of the universe? I think the answer is there. It's just too shocking for almost all scientists and philosophers to accept. It requires the greatest paradigm shift of all time, far greater than the Earth revolving around the sun and far greater than the speed of light being constant. I suggest today's scientists are educated to ignore the obvious. But the answer is there, and the experimental facts cannot be denied. Here's how I see it. Matter, space, and time are a constructed illusion. There is no such thing as a particle in the ordinary sense. Particles are concepts constructed on a concept of space. How else can you explain the one slit, two slit experiment where the photon goes through one slit and it goes through both slits? Space and time are a constructed illusion. There are connections outside of space and time. How else can you explain quantum entanglement? Perhaps thought alone is the foundation of the universe. How else can you explain the quantum Zeno effect? The universe is immaterial, material, mental and spiritual. That last quote is from Richard Kahn Henry of Johns Hopkins University. In a 2006 review of a book on quantum physics, Henry writes, in his Gifford lectures very shortly after the 1925 discovery of quantum mechanics, Arthur Stanley Eddington, who immediately, I assume that, should be immediately when quantum mechanics was discovered, re realized that the, this meant that the universe was purely mental and that indeed there was no such thing as physical, said, it is difficult for the matter of fact physicist to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character. What an understatement. On this fundamental topic, physicists are mostly terrified wimps. Six paragraphs later, he continues, I really do not understand how it can be that so little attention is directed to what is acknowledged to be the deepest discovery ever in human intellectual history. One that has changed our understanding of our own nature far more than did the Copernican revolution. Physics led Richard Kahn Henry to believe in God. To put it plainly, atheism, scientism, naturalism maintains that we exist as accidental creatures of a material world with no greater reality, a what you see is what you get reality. Quantum physics contradicts this view. Quantum physics suggests that we exist, at least in part, in a what you think is what you get reality, and perhaps, just perhaps, in a what God thinks is what you get reality. Which, of course, puts miracle on an entirely different footing. When you strip away preconceptions of matter, space, and time, quantum physics can be liberating. To quote Henry one last time, it is more than 80 years since the discovery of quantum mechanics gave us the most fundamental insight ever into our nature, the overturning of the Copernican revolution and the restoration of us human beings to centrality in the universe. I suggest our minds are our connections to the ultimate, to God. I know this may sound radical. I hope that you can be open to the possibility. As they say, the facts are the facts. Number appears to be the foundation of the universe. The arrow of all of physics points to mathematics as the underpinning of it all. Quantum physics defies conventional concepts of matter, space, and time, and replaces them with new realities of existence described by heavy math. If ideas expressed as mathematical concepts are the foundation of the universe, perhaps there is a great thinker. We have not proved the existence of the God of the Bible, but again, we have taken a major step in that direction. Of course, we don't know if our current theories of general relativity and quantum physics are correct. We don't know how to extend general relativity to the level of the quantum, and it could well be, for example, that general relativity is only an approximation or a special case of a deeper theory, in the same way that the classical mechanics of Isaac Newton are an approximation of general relativity a special case that works very well for velocities much lower than the speed of light. But both general relativity and quantum physics have withstood decades of testing. But what if space-time is discrete?
space-time would have a granularity, perhaps a fundamental unit. And perhaps that unit would be a mathematical concept. And of course, that is where people will go with uh, uh, the universe as a simulation. My suggestion is, uh, my suggestion that the foundation of the, of the universe may be made up solely of mathematical concepts is consistent with a branch of theoretical physics called string theory. String theory proposes that everything in our reality, all matter, energy, space, and time, comes from fantastically complicated mathematical structures. Some propose that these structures have nine or ten dimensions and that vibrations in the strings or surfaces of these structures create all of the effects of our reality. We don't experience nine or ten spatial direct dimensions, they say, because all but three are tightly rolled up at a subatomic level. To me, quantum physics is the bridge between our reality and concepts of number. Hundreds of theoretical physicists are struggling to understand what those concepts could be. Why should it be that everything in the universe obeys concepts of number? It is described by elegant mathematics. How can quantum physics shatter ordinary concepts of matter, prove connections outside of space and time, and suggest that thoughts are supreme? To me, the combination of these two insights toward an immaterial universe of thought is a seventh wonder of modern science, the final step in our count to God. We do not live in a purely material world. We live in a world, a universe of thought. I believe God used thought Concepts of number to create a universe capable of supporting life and human beings. The book of John in the New Testament begins in the beginning was the word. I believe this is consistent with all Abrahamic faith. I believe we and all of existence are thoughts in the mind of God. Quantum physics requires a non-material agency outside of space-time, states the Center for Quant Quantum Philosophy in Switzerland. The material world emerges from non-material fe features. Anybody remember about, by faith, we believe that, that the uh, world, is, that the visible came from the invisible? To illustrate this, I offer the following diagram. God uses a number to create the universe, designed so that human beings can exist, creatures capable of both understanding number and detecting evidence of God. I call it the circle of existence. And this is his final uh, uh, comment. Uh, it's interesting that we start with God, we go to number, we go to universe, we go to human beings, and human beings, again, if they wish, can recognize God. I would put one more arrow and that would be coming down from God to human beings as well. But my own take on this is that I agree with Doug L here. Uh, the universe is based on mathematics. Mechanics can explain the universe partially, but not completely. Pure, uh, have, as it's known now as naive materialism, is dead. Naive realism. For quantum mechanics to resolve similarly for everyone, there must be a final observer. That is, when we do the experiment, we, we both see the same result. Those of you who have been here for years in this Sabbath school may remember that we discussed quantum mechanics and God. Turns out that it's the top hit for this class according to YouTube. For those of you who are interested, you can Google it. It's quantum weirdness and God. I am pleased to note that Doug L. agrees with me on this. It is important to note that even if quantum mechanics turns out not to be the absolute truth, materialism still cannot account for reality. You see, the experiments still work whether our explanation for them is correct or not. They still defy any kind of mechanical theory of the universe. This also implies that God is everywhere and is active right now sustaining the universe. Think about it. It completely trashes a deist god. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn.
Go ahead, Ariel. I, it seems to me that uh, uh, the lesson, one of the lessons here that uh, is very serious and, and profound is that you know, this has been going on for what, 80 years, 100 years, uh, 1905 was when quantum mechanics first but read its ugly head as an actual theory. But uh, we just go on merrily uh, as though it uh, wasn't there and it was not something to be taken into account. And we just stick doggedly to our materialistic approach. I'm speaking of the scientific uh, ethos here. Uh, as though it was uh, plausible and can work on and so on. And uh, what does it take to to, uh, to change the scientific ethos? Uh, I mean, it's not just this. You know, there, there are problems of all kinds of other problems. Oh yeah, uh, uh, time problems and. Uh, how long do we give for the origin of life to be solved? before we say maybe it can't be solved in that way? Uh, the sobering thing here, I think, is that uh, we're dealing with uh, attitudes more than we're dealing with facts. The facts don't seem to be so important here in our thinking. And I think we need to learn a lesson from that. Yep. Let's comment over here. I'm puzzling with one aspect, and that is how does one ascertain that what is observed has changed without having the ability to observe it before it changed? In other words, how do you know that what you see is not just what is there and that it was different if no one had tried to measure or observe it? That this is... This is the area I keep coming back to as a, as a long-term scientist. Well, okay, one of the things that you can do. In other do. words, can you, can you open for me further how you use or uh, physicists use the term observe? Well, um, photons are notoriously difficult to observe. Understood. Um, usually once you observe it, you pretty much destroy it. Electrons can be observed without having to uh, destroy them. Mm -hmm. Because if you send them through a coil, they will give a tiny impulse sure. that can be measured. So one of the things you can do is you can send electrons through uh, a, a small aperture and measure them as they go through so that you know because of the size of the pulse that there is one electron going through at a time. It isn't guesswork. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, if more than one were going through at a time, they would tend to repel each other and therefore not be coherent. Um, but, uh, but even if you somehow assume that they somehow become quantumly entangled with each other, and then separate the, the charge they're carrying is a unit charge, and so therefore you've got one electron. You can send that electron through uh, two pathways. Have it join together afterwards, and you can observe that it hits at a particular spot on your detector screen. Okay, what are you meeting by pathway? Well, you know, you put, it, you put it into basically a vacuum chamber of some kind and uh, so that you don't have interference from various other uh, atoms, molecules, whatever. Uh, and, then you, uh, and then you measure that the electron has gone through this area at a specific speed within quantum variation, okay? Um, then it is allowed to go through where there are two apertures at the end of the path, pathway, sort of like the two-slit experiment. It could go through either. I'm going to develop this in just a little bit. 
and then it goes through both and it hits on a screen. When you measure where hundreds, thousands perhaps of these electrons hit, they will give you stripes on your screen. An interference pattern. And it's described by quantum mechanics to as many decimal places as we can measure. So you've got, you've got these electrons going through. Okay. And it seems pretty obvious that they're obeying a wave function that we can describe. Okay. So now what you're going to do is you're going to put detectors on each pathway. Nothing happens yet. You turn the detectors on so you can tell which pathway it went in. It will never go through both pathways at the same time. It will always go through one or the other, but not both. But when you do that, you lose that interference pattern you had. just the act of measuring it. Actually, the act of recording it to be very precise. If you hook it up so that it goes through the coils, but you can't tell which coil it went through. But you, you had to measure without turning on anything in order to know what happened when you didn't observe. In other words, you have to observe to understand what happened. Well, actually, you didn't observe. it's weirder than that, okay? You measure, you turn on one of the detectors, but not the other one. You still know which pathway it went through, and it still loses the interference pattern. Because you know that it went through detect the beginning detector, and it didn't go through the detector you had on, and therefore you lose the pattern. Uh, physicists have struggled with this a lot. And, and they've come to the conclusion that the electron is obeying laws that have no mechanical explanation for them. <laughs> yeah, I, explanations come to without a foundation on observation often have very wide boundaries the important thing is the boundaries do not overlap with what you would expect from from any kind of uh, explanation where the electron carries with it I'm not at all surprised in the kind of discussion as a biologist it's a bit out of my world yeah. but <clears throat> let's leave it there I still it still seems ultimately you have to observe and if the act of observe observation changes, but let's, yeah. let's leave it with that. I, well, know, I know there's not a direct, clear yeah. answer. But I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another example that is perhaps uh, even more impressive in some ways. Uh, according to the Bose-Einstein uh, effect, and now this can be tested and has been tested and has, shown, has been shown to be true, you can take, they usually pick rubidium atoms because they're particularly easy to do this with, um, easier than most things. You can take and cool rubidium atoms down to a point where they are within a quantum of absolute zero. Can't actually get to absolute zero, but you're getting as close as you possibly can. When that happens, the best way I can describe it is their waveforms overlap. And so you can have literally billions of atoms of rubidium stacked in one spot. I'm not talking about stacking together like you would in a crystal. I'm talking about they overlap in one, the space of one atom. Um, that means that a collection of protons, electrons, neutrons can behave as if it was a single waveform. Atoms are waveforms. But only after observation. Once you observe I'm, them, I'm sorry. Let, you, 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 know. you can shine, you can shine a, uh, you know, a light on it and photograph what gets absorbed. 
And when you do, you find that the, the absorption is extremely small and extremely dense. Let me just leave it with having thought about this before, and I might insert parenthetically by having a new grandson by marriage who just started physics at Caltech. This is not a new discussion for me. But uh, I guess, to me, I'm in the same place I was. There's just a lot I can't understand and don't understand. And I'm sometimes skeptical, and I'm not responding yeah. to you at all. I'm some kind of skeptical about explanations that have, to me, built-in limitations that mean explanation is nearly impossible. Yeah. Quick yeah. I, I, other people who want it. The, 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 the argument that he is making is not so much that uh, quantum mechanics is true, although certainly if it is true, it means God is an incredible mathematician. Uh, the argument that he's making is that the old naive realism that insisted that atoms and electrons and protons and neutrons were physical entities that couldn't be messed with is falling apart. Well, actually has fallen apart a long time ago and, and, and we just have too much trouble wrapping our heads around that. Well, a lot of us got our introduction, I did, with going back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and I haven't really been able to see much beyond that, so thanks. That is true. But let's take that is true. Questions. Okay. Yeah, good to see you, Jack Stout. Welcome. Um, I'd like to discuss very briefly the God of the Gaps idea and how it might relate to this. The main criticism of God of the Gaps is as the knowledge and discovery of science expands we have a shrinking God, or at least our concept of God, shrinks. Here is a case, in my naive way of thinking, is when we look at a, a smaller and smaller reality, our knowledge of the universe expands. Therefore, if God is in the picture, our knowledge of God expands likewise. Am I off base, or does this make sense? Uh, no, you're not off base. Uh, actually, the God of the gaps is an understandable caution, but I think that it's, it's one that ultimately cannot be fundamental. And I'll explain it to you this way. Uh, it is true that as we get, for example, if we were to have somebody, well, somebody who's growing up, or somebody who is from a culture that has left less technology than ours. Uh, she walks into a door. The door magically opens. As a matter of fact, maybe she's inquiring, so she steps back and the door closes again and steps in and the door opens again. Magic, right? Until you know that there are photosensors and that they detect changes, you know, they detect motion uh, using a computer algorithm to do so. And when they detect enough motion, they decided that the door needs to open. Okay, now it's suddenly all plain and we don't need God. Well, yes and no. We don't need God maybe, but we do need a designer. That doesn't happen by itself. Okay, so yes, you have to be careful. Does God do things directly, or does He design it so that it just happens kind of on its own? Uh, that's one of the uh, one of the questions that comes to our minds in that kind of situation. Um, and the argument was made that science conquered this, conquered that, conquered this, conquered that. Eventually, science is going to conquer everything and your God will be out of a job. That's, that's the argument in a nutshell. 
The truth of the matter is, though, that the God of the gaps ignores two things. Number one is that um, sometimes as science marches on, we discover the things that we thought were quite simple turn out to be terribly complex. And now all of a sudden, uh, areas that need some kind of intelligent explanation open up. And the best example I can give you is the origin of life. You may remember that not too many centuries ago, people thought that flies just spontaneously organized out of rotting meat or whatever. And we discovered, no, flies actually have to come from new flies. People thought that bacteria just came from rotting stuff. Pasteur showed, no, bacteria come from other bacteria. All of a sudden, not only do we have to explain large life, which kind of people knew all the time, but we have to explain the small life as well. That life itself requires an explanation, and the harder people have worked on that, the tougher that problem has become if you exclude intelligent design from the explanation. But if you include intelligent design, it becomes immediately apparent that we're talking incredibly intelligent design. Design with, if I can say it that way, godlike intelligence. And I think the case for a creator is stronger now than it was five centuries ago. Because we know more. So it is not true that science is constantly progressing and constantly getting rid of God in the process. In fact, as science does some things, it opens up. And I think quantum mechanics is one of the places where it's opening up. The universe cannot be explained by the rattling of atoms. It just can't. Even if quantum mechanics turns out not to be the exact right theory, the experiments are still there and they still defy any kind of explanation that allows for a combination of relativity and ordinary science. Now, the, the, second, the second flaw in that argument is even more fundamental. What it is is basically saying, you lost here, you lost here, you lost there, you should just give up. That's what it really is saying. Don't wait until you lose, you know, 500,000 more times. But if you think about it, any entity that we know of is, in fact, explained by a gap. How do I know that you're sitting there? Well, because when I look at you, I don't see a chair. I see something else. And furthermore, it looks human, and it occasionally allows a smile to cross its face, and um, looks female human. Uh, those could be classified as gaps if I wanted to maintain that there's nothing there but a chair. Well, maybe it's a cardboard cutout. You see, as we try to, that's how we do things. We look at things and we see that they don't follow the standard protocol and instead they follow something else. The fact of the matter is that we don't detect anything except by gaps in perception that follow a specific pattern. Now, I suppose you could argue that, well, you, then just any old uh, gap doesn't count, and that's probably true. 
But if gaps, <coughs> excuse me, if gaps follow a specific pattern, it is entirely rational to say that that pattern means something and that there's something actually there. How do I know I'm sitting on a chair? Because I don't find myself sitting on the floor. How do I know that the lights are on? Because I can see. They look on and they give light to the room. Things that don't have any effects for practical purposes don't exist. We have a comment back there. And so the insistence on God of the gaps can never be used is basically insistence that you can never have evidence for God. That's so, what it really is. It's an, it's an uh, argument that has you surrender before you even get started. So that's why uh, science always asks that question, you know, what is a reality after all? And that is the task to, to find out. But I'm coming to this uh, question whenever it seems to me that science doesn't know the answer. Like... Uh, uh, these guys, New Age or Stephen Hopkins, you know, they try to escape to uh, dark matter or dark energy, trying to find the answer there. And uh, my Bible says God created in the beginning and, and, and the, started from the world. Uh, more, there is a sense then. Uh, just uh, saying um, it's a dark matter, you know, it's, and we don't know. And they don't know what is it at all. So, so we are so glad to, to know that, that the Word of God, it's, it's more a reality for us and acceptable. As, as you mentioned through through this uh, lecture for fellow, I will, I will rather accept God, I will, that concept, than just try to escape to, to that dark matter, you know, or dark energy, you know. Mm -hmm. Talking about a life also and something else. So, yeah, Bible, it's, it's awesome. And we should stay with that concept. Paul? Yeah. Yes. Uh, going on with the uh, God of the Gaps uh, concept, uh, an idea that I like is, is what is called God of the Necessary Gaps. In other words, the God of the Gaps concept is too broad a concept to relate to all situations. There are those situations where God seems absolutely necessary and it's, we could uh, probably mention quantum mechanics as one in there. But I would say, you know, the fine-tuned universe uh, is one of them. The origin of life is another. Uh, the the origin of complexity. The, the idea that the Cambrian suddenly poof and everything is there. The uh, phenomenon of mind, consciousness, uh, reason... Uh, uh, I think these are God with the necessary gaps. Uh, and I think uh, we should not fall into the trap of, oh boy, uh, I got you a God of the gaps because there are those situations where uh, science has demonstrated that, uh, you know, the religious influence has been wrong. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and of course, we can find situations where evolution has been wrong as well. I mean, it is, uh, right. but, but there are those things that seem so dominant that I think you can almost classify them as necessary gaps. I think there's one other thing that, that goes with that, and that is that it's not just a matter of the necessary gaps, but it's also, if I can put it this way, they're the, the God-shaped gaps. That is to say, it's not just that I don't see your chair behind you, and so there must be something there, but it also happens to correspond to a human. 
and to a particular human um, that I recognize. And so it's not just a matter of, uh, of that there are gaps, but also that there are gaps in particular shapes, if I can put it that way. And I think that when you have that kind of shape to the gap, you can be a little more comfortable saying that uh, it really is God. And one of the things to keep in mind is, well, could you be wrong? Well, sure, you could be wrong. I could be wrong. Anybody could be wrong. But if you're going to live your life always worrying about that kind of outside possibility, you'll never do anything. I mean, for all I know, there's an actor who's put on a face that looks like Warren Johns. And, you know, uh, has, has studied Warren Johns' mannerisms well enough to fake me out. Do I worry about that? Not really. Dr. Meyer. The question that observation changes things and that thought um, drives particular things is um, very clearly a God concept that um, when you think about that and lay that on the Bible, it makes fantastic sense. Um, Ellen White makes one comment uh, to help with that. It says, Christ is represented by the Holy Spirit, and when this Spirit is appreciated, when those controlled by the Spirit communicate to others, the energy with which they are imbued, an invisible cord is touched, which electrifies the whole. Would that we would all understand how boundless are the divine resources. So the concepts of understanding this uh, was put to some study where the, uh, in the British Medical Journal was, it was looked at the Framingham group of people and they wanted to know where did happiness affect people? And happiness is a concept. And they de determined the statistical significance that if you were happy, people that knew you, that lived within a mile of you, were statistically healthier. It was a very interesting concept. Bring the mic down here. Go ahead. Very briefly, uh, having had the opportunity to interact with some wonderful, very bright Adventist young people for many years, we turned the term God of the gaps around. We describe God in the gaps. And as we understand the gaps, we're looking at God's handiwork. I think that does it. Well, I agree with you completely. Uh, I, I think I think it's a mistake for us to try to to try to be afraid of using a God that that stands in when we reach the end of our resources. Uh, we often, in our discussions, uh, would talk about the way science treats so-called gaps. And unfortunately, I think there are elements of Christianity which reinforce their approach, and that is God only works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform, which we will never understand. Which means if we understand it, you can interpret it, then it wasn't God. Yeah, yeah. That's perhaps, to me, the most dangerous dimension of this whole idea. Well, the, the God, well, one of the things that, that quantum mechanics is arguing is that everything we see, literally, because that's light, yeah. all molecular bonding, all atoms, that doesn't leave very much out, does it? God so, is directly least. involved with everything we everything we have to do with. Uh, think about this, what that really means is that when Jesus said, every hair of your head is numbered, 
he was not exaggerating. He was actually dumbing it down for us. When Ellen White says that it is by the direct action of God that breath follows breath and heartbeat follows heartbeat, she was being literally correct. God is involved in every single thing that happens. That's a sobering thought. I, I think the, the world of of uh, the quantum is, is, it can be found in various places in the Bible, and I think it's, um, I, I kind of look at this uh, in this passage of Daniel as being kind of a, a view into the quantum world. I'll just read a few sentences here. It says, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in, in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. And then it says, at the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. So as soon as Daniel started praying, something happened in heaven, and the command Even was issued. Even before he finished. Before he finished. Is that entanglement? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like that entanglement. I think I'll keep it. Well, next week, stay tuned for part three of the book. Uh, and uh, we will continue uh, looking at science and how it interfaces with God. And I think it's arguable that the, the interface is broad and uh, near universal. The only places where it doesn't interface is where we don't want it to. And let's hope that we... Uh, Keep that to a minimum. <laughs>